At Granger, we're for the ones who pay attention to every little detail. The ones who fuss, tinker, and sweat the small stuff. Because you know the tiniest thing can make the biggest difference when it comes to keeping business moving. We get it. We're the same way. Offering access to product experts to help you quickly and easily find what you need. So whatever your industry, you know you're always getting professional-grade products. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 432, Blood on Blue Beach. Last time, while the attack on the Hess Battery to the west of Dieppe near Varangaville had gone well, though due to a lucky mortar round, it was the exact opposite of the Goebbels Battery at Bernouval. There, many commandos were killed or captured, and the guns remained operational. But the fighting wasn't over. It had just begun. To the west, at the Hess Battery, now that the large gun was out of commission, Number 4 Commando went in for the kill. And there would be no Marquis of Queensbury rules here. At 6.10 a.m., troops B and F were in place, waiting to launch their part of the attack. Lord Levant fired his flare pistol into the air, and the men went in, bayonets fixed. And these long blades of steel would see much work this morning. The commandos charged over open ground, were shot at by machine guns, crawled through barbed wire, hit strong points, and won through sheer momentum, only then ending up at the large gun. Or as Levat wrote it up afterwards, F Troop, who behaved magnificently, suffered heavy casualties. All their officers, Captain Roger Pettyward and Lieutenant John MacDonald, were killed leading the charge. Captain Pat Porteous took over and was wounded twice, but continued until he fell, shot through the legs on top of a gun position. The company sergeant major had his foot blown away by a stick grenade, but continued to engage the enemy in a sitting position. To his lordship, this was magnificent. To the average person, it was carnage, but acceptable carnage as his side had lost fewer men. But it didn't stop there. Now the underground tunnels had to be cleared, and they were with the same pitiless efficiency. A German military commander and two of his aides were shot at close range only after they were chased. The enemy here was wiped out, but their large guns remained, even though they were damaged or blackened by the cordite explosion. So, leaving nothing to chance, the demolition teams stepped up. The men loaded a shell into the breach, but also put a lump of plastic explosive just behind it. And when the fuse of that burned down, the barrels opened up, just like a banana peel. And now it was time to go. The dead commandos were laid out, and purposefully adding insult to injury to the Germans, a Union Jack was raised over the battery. Those who had been wounded, and there were many, were put on stretchers, or doors, now commissioned as stretchers. Four German POWs were ordered to lift two of the stretchers, and it was made clear to them that they had better not drop its occupants. Considering all the death around them, the Germans got the message. But it would be at Blue Beach, the position just east of Dieppe and in between Red Beach, which was at Dieppe itself, and Yellow 2 Beach further east, that would determine if Jubilee was a success or not. As Commodore Hughes Hallett himself said, it had always been realized that unless the East Headland, that is, Blue Beach, was captured, the frontal assault on the town on which the whole operation chiefly depended would probably fail. But as we have seen, the Far East landing was far from perfect. Fortunately, Blue Beach was much closer to Red Beach than to Yellow 2 Beach, where the disaster was. Not that it would be easy for whoever landed at Blue Beach. For the men going ashore here would have their own battery to take out, labeled Rommel. And more besides, there were machine gun nests and AA guns. From there, after those were taken out, they would split up, some heading for a battery even further south, while others went into the city and destroyed its gas works and power plant. But also important, as the city, of course, would be repaired in time, the war office back home 
wanted a new German device, a German gun sight, captured and brought back. And who was going to be landing at Blue Beach? 554 men of the Royal Regiment of Canada on 18 assault landing craft and two mechanized landing craft. The way it was worked out on paper was that companies A, B, and C would land first with an advanced section of the HQ group. Then D Company would land with the rest of the HQ personnel, which included Colonel Cato, the commanding officer. And finally, on the third incoming wave, three platoons from the Black Watch of Canada, along with the artillery and AA detachment, would make sure. The first wave was to negate the German defenses at Puyi, and then move inland from there, engaging the aforementioned machine guns and flak batteries and anything else that the enemy might have recently thrown up. This would leave another detachment to head into Dieppe itself proper to carry out the destruction. But the men who did the initial fighting wouldn't be done. Whoever captured the large guns, well, those not damaged, would then be turned on the enemy. The Germans may have more men, but their own guns would be used against them. Before we go on, the landing craft assault, or LCAs, were flat-bottomed, and their bow door and sides were armored. A Bren gun was at the front to provide some defense for the platoon of 36 men. Comparatively, the landing craft mechanized, or LCM, could carry 100 men, or one tank. But it would be even before the Blue Beach landings that Jubilee would start to unravel. And at this point, it's up to the individual to decide for themselves if what was to come was fate, destiny, the hand of a higher power, or simply how the events played out based on the decisions made by the individuals. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. When the Canadians left Great Britain, the Royal Canadians were on the Queen Emma and the Princess Astrid, and the Black Watch sailed on the Duke of Wellington. Once they got closer to shore, they were to move to their 18 LCAs and two LCMs, respectively. The man in command now, Colonel Cato, had chosen Major Forbes West as his battle adjutant to stay in contact with the units, and Major West watched Disheartened, as at 2.30 a.m. when the transferring took place to the smaller boats, chaos dominated the process. A sense of foreboding filled the major. And that foreboding would prove prescient. As the motor gunboats were to lead the landing craft in, one fell out of position. So the landing craft accidentally lined up behind the Princess Astrid. It took at least 15 minutes to straighten this out. Then, the naval commander in charge of the landings, Lieutenant Commander Harold Goulding, knew he would not be able to simply sail to Blue Beach. It's a relatively small opening in the cliff. So, he decided to sail close to the town of Dieppe itself, and then once closer, he would turn north and go along the coast to search out this opening. This, of course, would cost more time. And finally, as the landing craft mechanized were slower than the smaller landing craft assaults, the LCMs fell behind. Only after all of this was straightened out did the first wave go in. Major West heard shooting from the area, but then it died away. West said to Cato, well, they must got through. But the CO replied, no, they didn't. They're all dead. So, how late were the landings? An officer on the Princess Astrid claimed the first wave went in at 5.07 a.m., so 17 minutes late. But some of the officers, a few weeks later, and sitting in a German POW camp, said that the first wave was 35 minutes late, which made the second wave an hour late, which, if true, means the entire operation would flounder. Or in the words of one of the captured officers, the operation was no longer viable. 
Opposing them, the Germans felt confident in their defenses, and they were right to do so. The 115 men guarding this part of the coast were the 12th Field Company of the 3rd Battalion of the 571st Regiment. Between them and the coast was a 75mm cannon and several MG-34 machine guns, and the latter were well hidden and protected in pillboxes and casemates. Still other machine guns were inside several villas, now turned into fortresses via sandbags. The villas were on top of the slopes, thus the beach before them was well covered. But what the British, and therefore Canadians, did not know of was a stone wall, about 12 feet high, that limited the access to the interior from the beach. And behind that wall was a casino, come Stronghold now built up with its own machine guns and sandbags. These guns dominated the view of the beach side of the wall, which meant if anyone landing here actually reached the wall, then the casino guns could not get at them. Not that it mattered, as enfilade fire from the left would finish them off. And this particular machine gun to the left, within a small concrete bunker within another villa's garden, had a view of the entire beach. And before this day was done, that lone machine gun would kill more Canadians than any other weapon that day. In other words, all the guns in the area were focused on this section of the beach, and the Canadians would have to come through here to make any advance. Bringing back Hauptmann or Captain Richard Schnosenberg, the commander of this sector, now that he was up, He spent his early morning looking through his binoculars, searching for enemy ships. And just as enough light let him see, he spotted a dark shadow out there. He guessed that it was a part of the convoy coming to Dieppe, that is, the German convoy. But while he was still looking at the ship, trying to figure this out, suddenly a Union Jack was seen above it. Collecting himself, he simply said, It's the English! Fire! And as more light came, he soon saw hundreds of ships out there. Meanwhile, Captain George Brown, the Canadian forward observation officer, who was to coordinate naval gunfire from the destroyer Garth, watched as the LCAs moved closer to shore. And soon, German bullets were pinging off the sides of the transport vessels. The first nine LCAs were soon close enough for the men inside to hear their respective ship scrape land. But even before the bow door opened, some men began to fall, as some of the bullets were able to pass through the ship's metal. Then, when the door did drop, the Germans focused their fire into the ship. As it was the equivalent of shooting fish in a rather large barrel, even more men fell, never having made it to shore. The men in the back of these LCAs either jumped over the side or crawled over their now lifeless comrades, anything to get to land and to get to that wall, as they thought it would give them cover. Within seconds, there were only three types of men, dead, wounded, or currently not dead or wounded. The men who made it to the wall, no matter their status, yelled for their comrades to keep firing anything to lessen the degree of enemy fire coming at them. Ramming into the flat pebbles, these bullets smashed, splintered, and then hit the troops on the beach. As rank has its privileges, Colonel Canto sent his second in command, Major George Schofield, with the first wave. But he went down while leading the men on the beach. Canto himself came ashore 20 minutes later with the second wave. And not being in the first wave also had its privileges. Men of the second wave who landed, along with the last of the first wave, saw their earlier comrades wave them to a cliff on the western side of the beach, its top hung over enough to provide some shelter. And then came a moment of panic, but alloyed with national pride and love of brother. As the second wave was coming in and began unloading, Intense enemy machine gun fire caused some of the men to pause. It's human enough. One LCM stopped just shy of the beach and put its engine in reverse. Meanwhile, the officers of the second wave, and again the last of the first wave, seeing this, 
ordered their men back to the boats. Some of them were able to climb aboard, but that's when six more vessels showed up to drop off their men. These were the men of the Black Watch. The Black Watch group, led by Captain Edward Hicks, was supposed to have waited longer, but he, along with Flotilla Commander Lieutenant Leslie Breach, seeing the carnage before them, rushed in to save as many of the royals as they could. Their countrymen were not going to die or be left behind to be captured if the Black Watch could help it. But Hicks, having seen what happened before this moment, wisely had his boats land to the west. Thus, their trip to the overhanging cliff was much shorter. The majority of his men made it to safety, but soon it wasn't safe. Quickly, the Germans on the clifftop realized that they could not shoot directly at the enemy, but there were other ways. Soon, stick bombs were landing near the men tucked into the base of the cliff, trying to make themselves very small. Still, the number of injured men increased, and those trying to take care of them were also injured. Needing to do something, or else soon all around him would be dead, Colonel Kanto had Bangalore torpedoes thrown at the wall to break a hole into it. But it came to nothing, except to get those men shot. The same thing was tried on the left side of the beach, as A Company Commander Captain Gus Sinclair and some of his men had ran that way. In a section that had concertina wire instead of the wall, the captain had Corporal Leslie Ellis throw his Bangalore at the wire. The explosion went off, and when the men looked up, a gap had been created. A Company moved forward, but without Captain Sinclair. He had been hit as he tried to follow Ellis through, who did make it. By this point, the beach was covered in blood, chaos, and bodies. The men still alive were used to following orders, but no one was giving them any. There was panic and a sense of hopelessness, for the Germans had placed their guns and men well. What could have helped the situation were the mortar teams, but as they needed a few seconds to set up, that was a few seconds too many. But then smoke from the ships started drifting over the beach. Sergeant Ewart Peaks used this to set up his mortar, and he fired off a few rounds. But before any more could be dropped into the tube, an enemy machine gun crew fired into the smoke. There wasn't that much of it, and the mortar went quiet. When the smoke cleared, Peaks was lying on his side. His lower half was completely gone. That's the power of a machine gun. As nothing was going to change or improve unless someone did something, men of the Black Watch and a few AA crewmen started climbing up the cliff to the west of the beach. Some of them made it three feet before they were killed. Some went halfway up before they came down just as dead. But one group did manage to get off the beach that day, that being Colonel Kanto and about 20 men. At the end of the wall on the western side, Kato cut through barbed wire and crawled through, and he was followed by about 20 men. They went to the closest villa, snuck around, and then they went through a garden attached to another house. This house had been built by the Marquis of Salisbury, of the powerful Cecil clan. Coming upon the clifftop road, Kato and company went through one house and then went through another, but the second one had Germans inside. The firefight was short-lived, as the Germans were caught unawares. Back on the beach, the Germans there figured out what Cato and company had done, and thus took one of their machine guns and trained it on that spot. All that tried to follow them were mowed down. Cato, seen all before him, was a debacle. He decided to head further west and find the Essex Scottish, who should by now have left Red Beach to come this way. And seeing a patch of wood, Cato led his small band into it. But before they could go much further, they soon found themselves behind a six-gun, 88mm anti-aircraft battery with appropriate sentries. Thus, they were trapped. But life, for them, became all the more hellish as those 88s started opening up. Not on them, but on the Allied vessels below. The German crews manning the 88s had their job made a little harder due to the smoke. 
but they had seen enough already to calculate where a boat would be when dropping off men, and thus fired. Soon, no other ships came forward to land. It simply was not worth the risk. But in cases like this, something is better than nothing. So Captain Derek Turner of the Royal Artillery aboard the HMF Garth started again directing the fire. Further, he was supposed to be working with George Brown on shore to fire where it would do the men on the beach the most good. But Brown did not respond. So Turner had the Garth keep firing, hoping it would lead to something. But as the enemy was above, they had the advantage and used it to keep the British craft away. Later, Turner would record in his diary, their rate of fire was just a little higher than ours, about 10 or 12 rounds per minute per gun. Every time they flashed, we all ducked down behind the hopelessly thin armor plating around the bridge. There was an infernal whine of muck flying around. Our high-velocity guns had little chance of scoring a hit on the Germans' hold-down positions on the clifftops. Still, the Garth's captain, Lieutenant Commander John Scratchard, was determined to do something, and his choice was to play musical chairs with the enemy guns above. As he described it, they, the enemy, was extremely accurate, and it was impossible to go in and carry out a steady bombardment. It was a matter of going through the smoke till close, squaring off, and then retiring, then circling around and repeating the maneuver. On each occasion, we were straddled, and it seems extraordinary that more ships were not hit. Finally, Captain Turner of the Royal Artillery heard from Brown on the beach, but it was not what he wanted to hear. The message simply read, Landed, seawall too high to cross. Can you send boats to take off casualties? Turner dutifully passed this on to the headquarters ship, Kalp. However, the signal was either not received, or worse, not acted on. Nothing was done. Well, almost nothing was done. One Lieutenant Noel Ramsey of LCA-209, he picked up the message, and he was determined to do something to help. He and LC-8, led by Lieutenant Francis Keep, agreed, and they both moved towards the beach. Lieutenant Keep had his boat stopped just short of the beach, and he used his 40 millimeter cannon and four machine guns to pour into the enemy positions, the ones that could be seen. This left Ramsey free to ramp up the speed and ram his boat onto the beach. The men on the beach who saw this ran for their salvation. Soon the LCA was full, then passed full. With at least 50 men on board, and more clinging to the sides, the boat was pushed back into the water. But quickly, water rushed in, as there were already so many bullet holes that water had no trouble finding entry. Not only that, but the bow door could not be closed as men were holding on to it, trying to get a ride. Soon, an explosion erupted just next to the LCA, and it capsized. One of the now-stranded men was a Private Simpson, He panicked and then realized panic wasn't going to help, so he started looking around. The firing at the overturned but still floating LCA remained a target, which now included German snipers. Simpson watched as one man, trying to ease his pain by moving, was hit three times in quick succession. Another survivor of the lost LCA, Corporal Ellis, crawled back to the beach but then soon realized what would happen if the Germans captured him. So he quickly pulled off his boots, dropped his equipment, and dove into the sea, staying underwater as long as he could. When he popped up, a sniper's bullet missed his nose by three inches. Ellis pretended that the bullet had hit him, and no other bullets followed. After waiting, hoping the sniper had moved on, Ellis now pulled off his May West and the rest of his clothes, and kept swimming away from the beach. This went on for two hours, and though he was terrified, he found now that his muscles would no longer respond to his commands. Then he came upon a body that had a perfect bullet hole in its forehead, but it also had a life jacket. Ellis took that off the corpse and put it on, letting the device keep him afloat. 
Just before he blacked out, men who had been on Ramsey's LCA, now aboard an abandoned dinghy, pulled Ellis out of the water. Ramsey was not there, as one of the many German bullets had found him. It will come as no surprise that no other boats attempted to reach shore. The men on the beach now belonged to the beach, and that meant the Germans. And knowing they had the invaders trapped, the Germans slowed down their attack, what with an occasional sniper bullet or stick grenade. On the beach and around this area, there were just over 200 men dead, or those who soon would be. Very few who were alive were uninjured. For all that had happened that morning, the Allied troops had actually seen very few enemy combatants. They had been well hidden and told to stay in place. But around 8 a.m., they started coming out. Reaching the beach, the victors had the prisoners who could help gather the wounded. Major Forbes West was put on a stretcher and then placed atop the wall he had been trying to cross. The irony did not escape him. Then the RAF showed up and strafed the beach. The men of all nationalities dove for the sand, which slowed down the gathering of wounded, and some of them would be taken out by the tide, as there was not enough time to collect them. As those who could walk started canvassing the beach, they came upon sights too horrid to mention. But mostly, they found body parts, not bodies. The Germans let the wounded men go to the beach three times to gather their comrades. After that, the searching was halted. Then a German officer came forward, and after examining his prisoners, those that he deemed beyond help, he shot in the forehead with his pistol. Meanwhile, Commanding Officer Major General Ham Roberts aboard the HMS Kalp had little in the way of communication with the other parts of Jubilee. But what he was told conflicted with other reports. Still, he must have known that Blue Beach was not a success. The question now was, what to do? Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just want to say hi to some new members and thank someone who has donated recently. Let's see, new members. Bruce L. Thomas from Oakland Park, Kansas. He's a retired pilot, uh, and he's written two books. Good for him. If you still have some summertime reading to do, you should check out Chaos Above the Sand. The reason I'm mentioning this, uh, Mr. Thomas didn't ask me to, but there's one part of a story where there's Rommel who's stealing gold and other treasures from Hitler to make his getaway, and that affects the book later on in the story. So anyways, uh, Chaos Above the Sand by Bruce L. Thomas, if you are so inclined. Uh, then there is Kevin Byers, who is a member, and he also bought a Churchill mug. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, he is from Atlanta, Georgia. Then there's James Harbison from Glen Carbon, Illinois. Thank you, James. And Harry Murray from St. Louis, Missouri. And lastly, but not leastly, there's Donald Quattlebaum, who made a donation. Donald, I hope I got the last name right. I'm not sure. No disrespect intended, sir. You're probably bigger than I am. Anyway, so um, I do have another interview coming out, but I'll probably couple it with a regular episode so that way you don't have to miss out on the story. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens from here. Take care, everyone. Bread Isle, are you ready to rock? Dave's Killer Bread is the country's number one organic bread for a reason. Always delivering killer taste, killer texture, and killer nutrition. This isn't bread. This is bread amplified. Dunkin' Ice Coffee is the... Sorry, one more time. Dunkin' Ice Coffee... Hey, Kelly, sorry. Um, we're trying to record a timely summer-focused radio spot for Duncan Iced. Can you stop with the shaking? But, like, this is the sound a Duncan Ice makes. Maybe you should keep it in? Mm, well, maybe. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. Try all the Duncan refreshers, iced coffees, cold brews, and lattes. Duncan Iced. America runs on Duncan.